Why, hello there. This is Michael Youngset of Modus Ponens TV. I say that, but I'm not actually a content creator. I'm a PhD student studying philosophy, argumentation, and games. Now, I wanted to practice my lecturing, and there was a topic in the community of gaming that has caught my interest. Two things came together, and now we're here, creating this video to get my thoughts out there just to see how it goes. So you clicked on this video somehow or other, you've seen the thumbnail, you know the title, so let's get into it. What's on my mind today? This topic. Yu-Gi-Oh! sucks to learn, but you know, it really doesn't have to. And let's see why that is. So a little bit of background context. So a video was put out by Hearthstone player, or perhaps a gaming enthusiast who likes card games, been trying a bunch of different games, called Rarime. He played a bunch of Yu-Gi-Oh! as a new player to find out what the experience was like, and it was not very fun for him. Now, a couple of big content creators in the space, Farfa and MBT Yu-Gi-Oh! made reaction videos, Ron reacted to the reaction videos, and so forth and so forth. And I'm sure in the time it took me to create this lecture and this video, I'm sure more has been said. So, this has got me thinking, because the main topic about what these uh, content creators were talking about was basically the new player experience. And because of the kind of things that I study in my history as a gamer, I actually have a lot to say about this. So, I'm sure absolutely no one knows who I am, so a little bit about who I am, at least insofar as it's relevant for this video. So, I've actually played Yu-Gi-Oh! since 2001. I'm not a new player. And yes, The Legends of Blue Eyes White Dragon did come out in the TCG in 2002. I've played Hearthstone uh, since the beta up until 2018, until it got too expensive. I'm from the generation where Pokemania was a thing, so I played the TCG at launch up until uh, I stopped. And I at least understand how Magic the Gathering works. But beyond my experience in card games, I actually have played a ton of different games over my years on this planet. In particular, a lot of the interesting stuff I have to say today actually comes from my experience in the StarCraft 1 and 2 esports scene. In particular, I actually happened to learn a lot from Day9, one of the original streamers on Twitch and one of the big content creators in the StarCraft space uh, at its height. Now beyond that, what else do I have to bring to the table today? Well look, I'm a PhD student, right? I actually had the opportunity to be in charge of a class at least one time. I was in charge of an entire term teaching people how to do critical thinking. I made lectures and made lesson plans. I've worked as a teaching assistant, working with the first year undergrads, trying to learn the stuff. And of course, in my academic studies too, I've actually looked at the pedagogy, learning theories and stuff like that. Again, it's not that much, but it's also not nothing. And so I have some stuff to bring together to the table in a kind of combination of things. And hopefully what I have to say will be enlightening and interesting to at least some person. So where do we begin? Well, there's three things really that are missing from this conversation that are problematic that I want to shine some light on. First of all, it's the fact that, well, commenters, they just don't understand teaching or learning, but especially in the context of competitive games, which is a different thing compared to other games. And something I want to draw attention to is the fact that, of course, being good at playing a game is not the same thing as making that fun of playing the game well accessible to new players. You might say that Yu-Gi-Oh! players can't read or teach. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is this idea that Yu-Gi-Oh! is idiosyncratic to the max. This happens to be the most important thing to know, and something that I'll be talking about towards the end, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Hopefully, after having gone through these three points, we'll have a better idea about, well, what's just going wrong in this whole discussion about the new player experience for Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> Alright. Section 1, which I have not so cleverly entitled, LOL, learn to play noob, just get good. And of course, whenever someone says this, I just kind of want to shake my head. A lot of people say this, but does he actually have any idea what they actually mean? What are they actually telling players to do when they tell them, learn to play? Because there's actually way more to this question, or way more to this demand than you can actually imagine. So let's talk about this a little bit. What is it that you could be learning? Well, look, on one hand, you have the very basics, the foundations of the game. This is like the mechanical stuff, 
What's a normal summon? How do you move a knight in chess? What even is a three-point shot? What is offside? These are like the basics. They define what are the elements of the game? What are the things? What are the moves? What are the basic rules, the resolutions, the interactions? Now, in Yu-Gi-Oh, how do you get the basic foundations? Well, you can read the rule book. If you play Master Duel, perhaps you'll go into these tutorial sections. Or if you play Duel Links, it actually has a bunch of missions, or not missions, but li little lessons hidden away in the menus that you can actually look at to look at explanations for how all the basic mechanics of the game work. So when you tell a player, learn to play, perhaps you could be telling them to learn the basic rules of the game. Fair enough, you probably should know some of these at some point. However, what a lot of players seem to mean is learn to play well, get good. And so at the opposite end of this spectrum from the very basics, you have like the advanced tactics and the strategies. And this happens to be where a lot of YouTube content comes up, right? If you're already a invested skilled player of the game, you want to learn more, very particular things. You'll open up combo videos, you'll look up deck profiles, you'll look up guides for how to do certain particular things. And of course, if you're also interested in a competitive space, you might also look up more third-party resources, you know, strategy articles. You might look at what's going on in the competitive scene, see what the trends are in the broader game, the metagame. Now, of course, on one hand, at the most basic, you have the foundations, the rules. On the other hand, the other extreme, you have these advanced tactics and strategy. But what is it that goes in the middle? And of course, more importantly, how do you get players from the very basics of reading the rulebook all the way up to where they can appreciate and understand what's going on at the top level of play? And this is something that I think does not get talked about. It's difficult to talk about. Most people don't even recognize it here. It's hard to even find words for it, and I've had to make up some. So in the middle is what I call the normative nebula. And let's talk about what this is. Now, it's one of the most important things when it comes to understanding how and why people fail to learn how to have fun with the game. So, let's talk about the, the basic components of this term. First, the nebula and being nebulous. What does it mean for something to be nebulous? It's to be amorphous, to be shapeless, to be cloudy. Basically, it's unclear and things that are shifting around, they're not solid. So, Nebulous by itself, not totally a problem. There are lots of games which are unclear, uncertain. You have to learn them as you go. They'll unfold themselves. There are a lot of mysteries. The mechanics are opaque. However, in the context of competitive games, there are other factors that can often combine with it to make the experience quite different. In addition to being nebulous, some games also in the competitive space will become overwhelming. They'll be oppressive, and they will feel brutal. And when you combine these things together, which happens a lot in competitive games, you will get a very unpleasant experience. And as Yu-Gi-Oh players will know, having oppression flipped on you is not a fun time. So, what is the solution to Noob? What is the out to the oppression? Well, it turns out in Yu-Gi-Oh, as well as other games of complexity, uh, other games of difficulty where this happens, the same, the solution is the same. Develop mental models. It's not the entire solution, but it is a big piece of it. So you put stuff into the nebula. You fill the void. You fill it with frameworks. You gain structures and schema. You will chart points of reference. You will effectively map the possibility space to use some fancy design language. And so even though this nebula may look difficult to navigate at first, slowly, bit by bit, you can add structure, 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 points of reference, and then you can finally understand how to have a happy time with the game. It, is no, it, can, it will transition from being this overwhelming thing, I know not what, to something, oh, I get it. And so that's what it means to be nebulous and how to you know, surpass the, ne the nebulousness. But what do I mean by normative? I actually mean normative in two senses. And if you didn't know, yes, this word has many word senses. So this nebula is normative in two ways. First of all, it's normative in the sense of you have to figure out what the normal or typical or the baseline of the game looks like in general. 
Now, I put some asterisks here because it's important to recognize I'm not talking about a particular game that match you're playing, not a particular instance, but the game understood as a general concept. What is the game like? And of course, in connection to this is the other sense of normative. What you normally should be doing, normative in that sense. What is it that you should be trying to do in general in the general game of Yu-Gi-Oh! or the general game of Hearthstone, general game of StarCraft? If you have the mental model that fills in this nebula, you'll be able to answer some of these questions. And a lot of it is this kind of thing. And this is generally what's lacking in a lot of new players. So just to recap what I talked about here. What are you trying to learn when you're being told to learn to play noob? Obviously, you could be told what you could do, the basic mechanics of the game, what do the rules make it possible to do at all. In the middle, there's this idea, but well, in, in the sort of moment to moment, in the big picture of things, what should you generally be trying to do? In chess, are you trying to control the center? In Yu-Gi-Oh, are you trying to gain advantage? In StarCraft, are you trying to build your economy? That kind of stuff and the important things surrounding those general principles and goals will fill in or compose this framework which fills in the, this nebulous ne uh, normative nebula. And of course, at the highest end, you have the very particular, focused, specific things, the actual strategies that have particular goals, particular considerations, things you were actually trying to do. So again, when you're being told to learn to play, there's a lot of things you can learn because there's a lot of parts to playing. You can learn what you could do, what you should do, and what to do. Now, what is the most important thing to put inside this normative nebula? Well, you'll have to stay tuned to find out. Even though, yes, I've already spoiled it, it has to do with recognizing idiosyncrasy. But we'll get to that. Before that, I want to make the case that this mental model that fills in the normative nebula is actually one of the most important things to gain for any gameplay experience. Not just competitive, not just Yu-Gi-Oh, but games in general. It's extremely important. Uh, although, of course, in the case of strategy games, such as Yu-Gi-Oh, it has an outsized importance. So I don't think in, I need to really justify this claim that fun comes in many types of forms and degrees. That's pretty obvious. Some people have fun power tripping. They have fun living out fantasies. Some people have fun just by having all the colors match. That's pretty cool. There's like an aesthetic kind of fun. However, in strategy games, what often drive, uh, brings players to strategy games is a particular kind of fun that involves expectation, prediction, testing, and the exploration of possibilities. When playing a card game, you might ask yourself a question, or I suppose you can describe what you're doing as asking these kinds of questions. You want to find out, well, what's going to happen if I play this card? What will happen if I sequence them in a different order? What will my opponent do if I do this? How can I do this better so that I won't lose? That kind of stuff. These will be strategic questions that you want to ask yourself. And it is often fun exploring the possible answers to this question. And so when you put it this way, it's way more helpful than those people who say, oh yeah, I like strategy games because it's hard or because I like dealing with challenges or I, I like interacting. I mean, that's technically involved in the picture somewhere, but it's not very specific. It's not very, you know, you can't really design to that as they say. It doesn't really help pinpoint what exactly is going on. So mental models are very important. I think they're crucial, especially in strategy games, because if you don't have a functional mental model of what the situation is like, what's normally going on, it is very hard to have this kind of expectation. It's very hard to have the kinds of framework needed to be able to ask or answer these kinds of questions. You know, it's not a function of knowing the rules of the game, and it's more than just knowing what you could do it's about having a grasp of the possibilities that this space can provide for fun situations. It's being able to say, oh, this is the game. Now, this is actually extremely important because if the fun from a lot of strategy games comes from navigating this possibility space, exploring what could go on, but you have no orientation, no sense of what the space is like, 
it's going to be hard to have that kind of fun. Perhaps a different form of fun will keep them hooked in. There's a reason that waifu tax is is a thing and why waifus are in games. But in general, you have to recognize that bringing players to the fun is actually extremely important. Bringing to the fun, them to the fun quickly is very important. Retaining new players is very important because in the modern day, if you're not having fun with the game soon, or you're not seeing the way in which you will soon be having fun, you can just go play another game. In the modern times, we have so many options for fun. Like, look, you can play Elden Ring, Vampire Survive, all these great games that have come out recently, which get you to the fun right away. And yes, some of these games might be actually more fun than Yu-Gi-Oh! But at the very least, you can say they bring you to the fun much more quickly so that you can find out whether or not this game is for you. Because if you don't have any sense about what this game is going to be like, how can you have uh, know whether you want to keep playing it? So, in the context of this discussion that um, these Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, these card game content creators were having on YouTube, a little sort of rhetorical question came up, a little bit of incredulity, this idea that you expect me to play for 12 hours to learn by myself before I can play against another player? And it's said in, with incredulity, I can't believe it. And I remember sitting there watching that and thinking, no idea, do you? Because unironically, in other you know, spheres of the internet, in other games, they will unironically say things like this in the action RPG space. Oh yeah, you don't have fun until the end game. It takes 50 hours for you to do all the basic garbage first, then you can the fun starts. And then of course famously MMO RPG players. Oh yeah, the real fun only starts at the end game and it takes you a hundred hours before you get to there. You can't even judge whether you like the game or not until you've played for a hundred hours. And of course mobile players say something similar. Before any of the guides out there will help you, you gotta play 200 games first, which of course lasts about 20 to 60 minutes. Now of course, I'm not saying that any of these are good takes. They are not. But I'm saying that this is an attitude that is common, and perhaps even worse, in other domains of gaming. And yeah, I, I don't think these are good attitudes to have. While a lot of people say this, that doesn't make them right. And so it is actually very important to recognize that there is something ridiculous about this idea that oh yeah you have to have you have to suffer for so long before you can actually have fun you know there is something to say about something becoming but you know that moment of revelation where it changes from being not so good to really good but you know it doesn't have to start from sucking to good it can start from good to even better so of course i bring this up to point out that you know the problem of the new player experience and obtaining new players and bringing them to fun it's not just a Yu-Gi-Oh issue. This is a recurring issue in other modern multiplayer competitive games as well. You know, StarCraft, League of Legends, Warcraft, Path of Exile, on-ramping experience, what the heck is that? Go read the guide, study for 20 hours or more. Because like in the context of a competitive game, it's an interesting question. How do you keep new players persevering? Think about the way in which we're framing this. Persevering, you have to suffer, you have to endure. And why is that? Well, because a lot of players who have survived until the point where they're enjoying the game, what they were presently going to be enjoying is high-level competitive play of some kind. And that is what they find fun. The reason they're sticking around to play the game is because they find it fun. So there's this idea that, oh yeah, this is the fun, but how do we get players to stick around to find that? Because they recognize, oh yeah, it's a very skillful game. The skill floor, the minimum requirements you need to be able to be viable, it takes a lot. Time, effort, energy, you need a lot to reach the skill floor. But how can you keep players invested such that they can actually get to that level before quitting? It's a weird question. However, the answer to that in Yu-Gi-Oh!, in StarCraft, in other competitive games is the same across the board. Developing a mental model of the normative nebula is what makes it possible for players to access the fun in the game. And in other games where they've sort of helped figure out how to cross this divide, how to bridge this gap, they have figured out a way to ease players into the game by sort of springboarding 
the uh, springboarding them in to developing their mental model for the game. Which leads me to my second point. You know, it turns out teaching is hard. Whether it's an in-game tutorial, a lecture being created by a PhD student, a content creator making video guides, the rule book, what have you, teachers in the classroom, teaching is actually pretty hard, not gonna lie. <clears throat> so let's talk about this just a little bit. I'm pretty sure I don't need to talk about, uh, defend this too much. We, ha we know this, right? You can be the best athlete, that doesn't mean you're gonna be a good coach. You can be good at leading, but not mentoring. Uh, if you've ever been in a university classroom, you'll know that some of the best researchers in the world, they're not good at giving lectures on their own research. And you've probably heard this adage before. A good teacher can make or break a subject for you. You hear this a lot in math, for example. It turns out, you know, of course, good teaching is more than just conveying the right information to students. It not, it's not just pointing them towards things to go look at. You know, and of course, it's not just showing off all the cool stuff. This is actually a common trap hole that a lot of players, not just in Yu-Gi-Oh, but in gamers across the board, will fall into. They will think something like this. Well, look, I had fun overcoming this challenge, and if I want the new player to have fun too, I should tell them to go do this challenge, and then tell it everything it needs to know to beat it. Then they'll have the fun that I have, they'll recognize that my, our time is being well spent, and we can have fun together, and look how awesome it is. If you were to put it simply, I'm having fun doing this. I want new players to have fun too, so I will get them to do this. Now, if you know anything about teaching, this effect is going to fizzle nine times out of 10. That's not how that works. Because it turns out a lot of the things that you need to know to actually beat this high level strategic challenge is gonna be high level strategic and tactical stuff. And you need to have context for that stuff to be meaningful or cool. It's fun if you already get it, but not fun if you don't. A lot of the things that are interesting in strategic considerations is about cutting corners for the sake of advantages. However, if you don't have any shape of what the game is normally like, how can you cut the corner? If there's no shape, is there a corner to cut? Likewise, you'll be trading off strengths for different strengths. Well, how can you make a trade or care about the trade without knowing the value? Strategy is cool because you're making good choices that are better than normal. But if you have no idea what normal is, what does the strategic consideration even mean? Again, so many players are actually very unaware. Most veteran players do not actually know that they have a mental model. Just how much it does for them. How they got it or how to help others get it. And that's a big problem. Because again, I want to reiterate, this is not a knowledge issue. It's not an information barrier. It's not an, even an access to information barrier. Although we can talk about that, those things definitely are there, but those are not the main problems. What's actually the barrier is a comprehension barrier. It's a literacy barrier. It's having the mental model to help figure out what even is going on barrier. It's the difference between do you know things versus can you make discerning judgments? Unironically, it's literally a skill issue. So just to emphasize what I mean by this, reading is one thing, reading comprehension is another, right? Look, here's a bit of philosophy. It is even insofar as it is reflected in itself that the reflected on is an appearance for the reflective and the reflective can be witnessed only insofar as it is consciousness of being so. That is, that the exact extent that this witness, which it is, is a reflection or reflecting which it is also. I mean, if you put this on a Yu-Gi-Oh card and told someone, bro, read your cards, you could tell them that 50 times. They could read it 50 times and it'll still mean nothing to them after the 50th time. It's not a reading issue per se, because reading is more than just having your eyes go across words. You have to understand what is the importance of what you read. How does it relate to other things? What are the implications? What are the considerations that attach to and surround the stuff that you read? If you don't have the mental framework into which you can fit this, then these words mean nothing. You can read without comprehending. And again, it's not a matter of just doing it more. Contrary to what a lot of modern RPGs will have us do, you can't actually just grind it out. 
Just reading more does not guarantee a development of the mental model. Just playing more does not guarantee meaningful progression in understanding what's going on. And most importantly, just losing more does not guarantee you will want to try winning. So, how to learning good. It turns out, bit by bit. Perhaps that's not surprising, but it needs saying. In the context of education, this is actually something that's relatively well known. There's two things to talk about, simulation and scaffolding. So what is a simulation? It's the when you go about incorporating new ideas or information into a pre-existing structure or a conceptual schema. And this connects up with this other activity called scaffolding. In essence, it's where you learn one thing to help you learn another and you use that to continue moving up and up and up like a ladder. So these things together, when you put them into the learning environment by a skillful instructor, or I suppose a skillful tutorial, you will have control over the rate of exposure that new players will encounter. Incremental introduction to content in a structured way that makes sense, that's piecemeal, that allows them to deal with it bits at a time, to incorporate it in as you go, that is important for developing a mental model. That is one of the ways to do it effectively and efficiently. Certainly not the only way, and there is definitely more to it than just this, but this is one of the things that old Yu-Gi-Oh players have inadvertently benefited from whether they realize it or not. Because, you know, back in my day, and again, I started in 2001, there was a lot less to learn, and the cards were easier to learn as well. Building that initial mental model from scratch was way easier. My base principal investment from which I could then add things was much easier for me to build. And of course, like I said, the linear progression of time naturally gives you incremental exposure to new content bit by bit. So again, here's just a couple of analogies to think about. If you try to jump into an MMORPG like World of Warcraft that has 25 years of not just story, not just power creep, but feature creep, it's going to be overwhelming. If you try to jump into a shonen battle anime in episode 600 and understand all the significance of everything going on, the character relations, the power, the backstabs, you're not going to have a good time. Likewise, understanding the decades of developments and refinements in the metagame of competitive complex games like chess, Go, or StarCraft Brood War, just jumping in and flailing around is not likely to lead you to a good time. So. Let me show you what I mean by assimilation and how you know old players have benefited from this. And of course, to give an idea about how perhaps a new player experience can be better structured if you really think about it. So back in 2001, it was relatively easy. You had monsters you could summon. You had effect monsters. They're like monsters, but they have you know abilities and they're usually weaker. And then you had big monsters. They, they needed tributes to access their big power. You had trap cards, which you can you know, put in the back row to be sneaky, but if you wanted to be fast and powerful, you could use spell cards, or I suppose they were called magic cards back in the day. And of course, you know, over there, once you figure that out, there's this other thing called like fusion monsters. They're, they're special. That's why you can special summon them. And then they're like ritual monsters. They're also special. You, you can special summon them in some other ways. And that was Yu-Gi-Oh! in 2001, right? But then new stuff happened. New stuff appeared. And so what do you do? Well, new players, likely, who understood the game, can use assimilation. Or, if you prefer this formulation, it's just like this, but with fundamental differences. Unironically, this is actually completely apropos to learning. One of the most effective, efficient ways to learn something is like, oh yeah, you know that thing you already know? Take that as the base, but then change it a little bit and now you understand the new thing. It's like that, but with fundamental differences. So look, Cyber Dragon, what the heck is that? Well, look, remember this, Curse of Dragon? Yeah, it's kind of like this, except with some fundamental differences. You don't have to tribute it. It just appears, but there's a restriction. Oh, I get it. What the heck is that? The Gizzy. Well, look, you remember 
Black Skull Dragon, right? And how polymerization works? Well, look, just like there, you need to have specific named materials. However, remember how it was like hand or field for fusion? Actually, these ones are field only. And you remember how you needed a fusion spell? Well, look, it's like that, but no. They just go back to the deck instead. Oh, I get it. It's like that, but with fundamental differences. And so look, when you appreciate this bit, then you can fit it into the rest of your mental model. You can update it with some new ideas, new considerations, new concerns. Because like, suppose you actually were playing a Black Skull Dragon beatdown deck for some reason. Your old goal would have been hope you draw polymerization while you have the fusion monsters or subs in hand. Then you'll sub your, summon your big beater to go beat. But now that you have this new bit of information into the normative nebula, maybe in the general gameplay of what you're up to, maybe now your goal shifts. You're trying to stick any two glad beasts on the board. You want to tag out so that you can contact for you as this guy. Changing this basic understanding of what could generally be going on in the game will have implications for what your particular strategies are going to be. And so, of course, bit by bit, you can integrate new information, new thoughts, considerations into what you already know. When Synchro Monsters appeared, how do you do this? Well, look, Synchro Summon. Remember Contact Fusion? It's kind of like that. You need the materials on field, except the names don't matter. Now you need this tuner, non-tuner status. And newly, for the first time ever, levels really matter. Neat. I got it. Exes Monsters. Remember Synchro Monsters? Yeah, it's kind of like that, but with some fundamental differences and this new thing where it's like, yeah, it, it gets attached to the energy card. It's kind of like Pokemon, right? Again, you can use your existing knowledge to jump start your understanding of new content. <clears throat> so let's use the counter example, Pendulum Monsters. Pendulum Monsters are unlike anything else in Yu-Gi-Oh. This is why it is so hard for a lot of players to wrap their heads around it. They have no comparison they can use to say, oh yeah, it's like this, but with fundamental differences. You know, some people will say maybe Pendulum Monsters are kind of like continuous spells, but really they're not. And no, I'm not going to read through all of this, but look, this is why learning things that are so one-off, so different from everything else can be really hard. And sometimes, of course, you do just have to knuckle down and actually just brute force understand and learn from scratch. But, you know, if you do have to do that every now and then, fine. However, that could be a problem for us to think about down the line. Anyway, skipping over Pendulum Monsters, Link Monsters, what are those? Well, again, remember Contact Fusion? You need to have stuff on the field, except this time the levels and names don't matter. It's actually just the raw number of materials that matters. Brute Force, you gotta learn the new zone mechanics. Got it. Ready to go. So, again... The, one of the problems that a lot of new player or a lot of content creators will talk about is like information overload, right? However, I want to point out that the complexity of that information is not actually the issue. It's the manner of presentation, not the matter that actually is the thing that we're worried about. If you go bit by bit, you can incorporate the information in a rather simple way. Again, complicated things can be explained simply and easily even if for pendulum monsters, it takes 12 minutes. Again, this is contingent on the fact that you are good at teaching and communicating, but it is indeed possible. One of the things about effective teaching, such that it is effective, is that it makes difficult things manageable and approachable and fun to do on purpose. That's what good teaching is about. But look, Yu-Gi-Oh has had 25 years of new content. If you threw it all at the new player at once, they have no idea where to start. It's a lot, right? If It's like this, but with fundamental differences. Well, they have no this to compare to. They have no baseline. And now, of course, I've only been talking about card types in this example. We know there is way more to actually put into this normative nebula to understand how and why things work, what's going on, what even I should care about or be thinking about in the big picture. But I'm just showing you that assimilation and scaffolding is one of the ways that you can slowly build up a player's knowledge base in a digestible, controlled, fun kind of way. You don't have to know all of it once to get into the highest levels of competitive consideration, because that's just not how that works. 
Which brings me to the third part of my little thought experiment today. So, it is true that learning is actually fun. However, not all learning is fun. And in the context of this talk, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a design hell. So, I know what you're thinking. You're going to think that I'm going to be talking about card text and how it's too hard to read, right? We know this example. This is the problem. If they made the cards easier, simpler, uh, easier to understand, new players wouldn't be scared away about the complexity of the game. And of course, I'll agree with at least part of this. Good rhetoric matters. You know, it's literally a paragraph of text when I put it up on the screen. And yeah, I do. Th and you know, most people, they're not going to read it because their eyes are going to glaze over. And yes, I do agree that you could probably format these cards better, add in keywords or what have you. And yes, that would be slightly better. So you're not wrong about this, but that's not the main reason why Yu-Gi-Oh! sucks to learn. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is an idiosyncratic pile of post hoc designs. And this is what makes it hellacious to learn. So what's an idiosyncrasy for any of us who don't know? It's an individualizing quality or characteristic. It's a characteristic peculiarity, or broadly speaking, it's some kind of eccentricity. You know the quote, right? Screw the rules, I have effect text. Let's get this out of the way. Everything in Yu-Gi-Oh! is actually covered by the rules. There is actual no, there is literally no cheating in the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh! People talk about this ironically, they speak as though it were cheating, but that's not what's going on. Think of it this way. The rules establish the baseline game mechanics that constitute the game itself. If you're not following those rules, you're not even playing Yu-Gi-Oh! at all. But you follow the baseline rules unless otherwise stated. The default is this. You go with the baseline game mechanics unless a card supersedes the normal mechanics with its own. This is superseding effect text. And yes, this is part of Yu-Gi-Oh's identity from the beginning, right? Superseding idiosyncratic text. It does a lot. It allows for tabletop RPG style, bottom up post hoc imaginative designs. It's like making it up as we went along and then writing it down. And for those of you in the know, that's literally the original spirit behind the manga that birthed dual monsters. They made it up as they went along. And look, you can see traces of this in some of the earliest cards in the game, like the infamous Swords of Revealing Light. You'll know it's not a continuous spell card because that didn't exist at the time. They made it up afterwards. And a lot of the text on this card is the card explaining how it has a special effect which supersedes the normal rule of the spell card going to the graveyard after it's used. And yeah, this is actually pretty cool. The superseding text allows Yu-Gi-Oh! to have a 10 in potential. It cr opens up massive possibility space for design. Like look, say what you will about tier limits, the fact that it has large paragraphs of text telling you how to do this new kind of fusion summoning allows it to do a bunch of new stuff. One card sync, uh, extra deck monsters. They continually reinvent ritual monsters. Trap cards as monsters. Link monsters that can use face downs. Pendulum monsters that <coughs> do weird things. And tabletop RPG the card game? W w uh, Hanafuda, the Yu-Gi-Oh game. And of course, even the ability to fuse field spells together into monsters. All of this is made possible by idiosyncratic text. <coughs> and really, this is part of the unique identity of Yu-Gi-Oh! And more specifically, this is what gives rise to these sort of like mechanical gameplay identities of the archetypes and cards you play. Like look, this is that idea that when the gameplay can reflect the lore of the cards. It's not just an aesthetic or a narrative identity for cards in Yu-Gi-Oh, there's actually a mechanical connection. Like look, they're Power Rangers. They got Zords they can jump inside and they combine together into a giant Megazord. Like that's really neat. 
it's one of the things that I personally find really fun about Yu-Gi-Oh! All this unique personality and charm overflowing from the mechanics of the card that resonates with the art. Very cool. All made possible by superseding idiosyncratic text. However, there is a downside to this. And I'm sure you can guess what it is. If everything is unique or novel, everything needs an introduction. Everything needs an explanation. And the more explanation you need, the more words you'll have. True, I think that the idiosyncratic superseding text does do lots of cool stuff for Yu-Gi-Oh! It's one of its greatest strengths, but it can also be one of its greatest weaknesses. Idiosyncrasy is the opposite of elegance, and elegance is one of the things that a lot of games strive for. Hearthstone is famously extremely elegant in the way it's been designed on purpose, and this elegance really helps you figure out how to develop a mental model of what the game is. So, let's use an example to show you the opposite of elegance. Say what you will about Pokemon, there is this whole type matchup chart which makes the gameplay rather elegant. What would the game be like if that were not the case? Just imagine you encountered this new Pokemon you'd never seen before, and you found out that it was Mega Marmite, Nefarian form. Okay. You knew that it was a normal fairy type. Okay. But you had to just know this, you just had to learn this, that it's weak to grass, ground, and water attacks. In particular, for some reason, it takes 3x damage from ghost and fighting types, but only when they're using their uh, same type attack bonus moves. Incidentally, it resists dark, normal, and dark and normal types across the board, but it also resists water attacks from flying type Pokemon only. It has, you know, extra power when it's grass fighting and ground, but when it uses fodder, uh, fire, water fighting, or psychic, it has lower accuracy. Imagine if you had to remember what this Pokemon did. Sure, it would be challenging, but I don't think it would be enjoyable. Again, imagine, and then imagine if there were 151 Pokemon were like this. That would kind of suck. Then realize that, of course, there are already thousands of Yu-Gi-Oh cards that are like this. Is this a fun challenge? Sure, it would be harder. Sure, it might be satisfying to be able to finally remember all of that. But just imagine this. If you had to do a card-by-card -card explanation for every card in this deck, how long would the deck profile be? How long would it take for a new player to wrap their head around what every card did and how they all work together and remember this in the context of what this deck does? Remember, if everything is a particular, then there is no general. And this is Yu-Gi-Oh's special challenge and why it sucks to learn, at least usually. Now, of course, Yu-Gi-Oh has a bunch of the normal challenges as well. It has terrible rhetorical choices and the way its card text is formatted doesn't help things. Like, for example, did you, like, old Yu-Gi-Oh players probably don't give this a second thought because they already understand this. It's become second nature to them. But explain to a new player that your effect monster has an effect that has an effect, cost, and a condition. Also, effect monsters are orange. Also, purple monsters are sometimes effect monsters even though they're not orange. Also, some effect monsters don't have effects. <clears throat> so look, and also, you know, in this game, as in others, there are gatekeeper players who see no need to teach for whatever reason, either because it's niche, or it's, this game's not for you, or perhaps they're reveling in the smugness towards the unaware. Oh, I know secret knowledge you don't. I understand the game because I'm very smart. And of course, there's the same problem of, of enthusiastic, well-meaning players who are nevertheless misguided who suck at teaching new players how to access the fun. These are common gamer L's, not unique to Yu-Gi-Oh, but they combine with the other ones to compound to make the new player experience for Yu-Gi-Oh kind of bad. So let's recap where we've been. Yu-Gi-Oh is an idiosyncratic mess of a game, which is a good thing and a bad thing. You know, we've had 25 years of feature creep. They keep adding new stuff. Players suck at teaching new players the things that they need to know. And of course, self-teaching, doing it on your own, 
it's a nebulous and overwhelming experience. Because of the way Yu-Gi-Oh is, every card and every deck has become idiosyncratic. Every deck is idiosyncratic. So every card has to explain in full how it works. And that's just so much to understand in addition to having to build up your mental model from scratch for our, for new players. So, is it possible to learn this power, even from a Jedi? Yes. New players do enter the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! somehow or other. But learning how to find the fun does not have to suck this badly. So of course, strap yourselves in, this is the pedagogy of Yu-Gi-Oh! Well, no, I have a dissertation to write, I'm not going to do that. However, I do want to say that, yeah, other games have figured this out. There are other games out there of complexity of a greater depth than, uh, than Yu-Gi-Oh! But perhaps they don't have as much problems with idiosyncrasy because they have a different kind of design philosophy behind them. However, the principles of good teaching are the principles of good teaching. You just have to know what to teach for and how to teach it. And so once we recognize that idiosyncrasy is such a big issue for new players to wrap their head around, perhaps we can start helping new players get it. And so that's what I have to say. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this video. As I said before, I'm not a content creator. There's no need to like or subscribe. But if you enjoyed what you saw today and you thought anyone can benefit from what I had to say, feel free to share it. I don't know if I'll do another one of these, but until then, good luck, have fun, and stay safe.